Now, very happy to say, joined in studio by Mr. Liam Hayes. Take your pick, All Ireland winner, journalist, editor, uh, in the business of publishing hero books at the moment, novelist, plenty more besides. You're very welcome. Great to see you again. Thanks, Jill. It's good to see you. I don't know which title feels more apt at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> lots of hats. Uh, lots of hats, but you get to my age, you need lots of hats. Because the, the hair is thinning anyhow. So. Well, the genesis of this chat, by the way, mm. is we spoke to you, I think on the evening Colm O'Rourke was appointed as Mead mm. Manager and mm. we had a good chat, your thoughts on, on yeah. Colm and how things would go. And literally that evening we were sitting around in the office and we said, we should get Liam in for a chat some evening and mm. it takes several months to organise these things. Yeah, so it's life, isn't it? Here we are. Yeah. Now, are you, are you um, more invested in Mead's fortune, fortunes with Colm there or, or where are you? No, I'm not. I'm, a, I'm the black sheep of that family. Um, <laughs> I think I may have said before, I don't do any reunions. I've done one reunion of our own Mead team in 30 years. I live in Dublin. Um, I stopped going to Mead matches. Uh, soon after I retired, I said, that's not working for me. Pretty soon after, about two years after I retired, I wasn't enjoying that experience. So I haven't seen Mead play live. I haven't seen Mead play live in, say, 13, 14 years. So I just watch them at distance, safe distance. And I think that's something that when you invest your life in, in something and you... And you when I'm the sort when you invest your life in something and you do something like for a considerable period of time, five, ten, fifteen years, you know, and it's over, then you know you, you turn you turn around and you go in a different direction. That's what I believe, anyhow. Did you like make a conscious choice? <clears throat> I don't want to be singing about the glory days for mm -hmm. the rest of my life, or was it just a very natural feeling which took hold? It wasn't necessarily a conscious one. It's really strange, Joe. I I didn't have a <clears throat> sort of premonition, but in the last line of my book, Out of Our Skins, that I wrote the year I was retiring in 1992, uh, and I didn't think, uh, like we're all odd in our own way. We're all on some sort of spectrum place. Like you haven't told the spectrum, but I, as far as I'm concerned, everyone on the planet's on the spectrum. Okay, some people are in a very bad place. Some of us are on it doing our own thing. Um, so I had no real sense of where I would go or what I would want to do, uh, but I did write in the very last chapter, last sentence of my book out of our skins was that I'm going to leave this room and I'm going to close the door and I'll be very happy to leave the door closed and I won't want to go back in basically to meet too many of the lads and uh, but you liked and that's how it turned you, out you did like them at the time I liked of course I did I liked the lads you're warriors you're fighting together yeah. you're vested in something you know what I mean you're literally you know you're you know cutting your hand and shaking hands and this is blood brother stuff all this sort of stuff uh, which is very real at the time but when you get to a certain age or a certain time in your career, you realise that this is not reality and there's a life waiting for you and there's other things waiting for you. And you also realise when I see young lads nowadays and I, and I don't, you know, I, I, I don't sort of I'm not knocking them, but you still find young lads saying, you know, this group of lads are the best friends of my life. I've got them for my life. They're friends for life. It, it just isn't like that. Uh, you all go your separate ways. And there's two or three lads who might be very close. Mostly everyone goes their separate ways. You know, not as far as me. I'm sort of, yeah. I like to be the outcast. But but they, everyone goes their separate ways. And um, when I look back on that, and this is not pointing fingers at any of the meat guys, there's 30 lads in that dressing room. You're not going to be friends with those 30 guys for life. Half of them you probably didn't even like to begin with. Mm. You put up with them, mm. right? Uh, and of the other half, there's some lads you liked and some lads you were very close to. So if you walk away with two or three friendships, you're doing very well. Mm. I mean, serious, like good friendships. Mm. Are you sentimental away from football in your life generally? Didn't sound like it. Uh, no, I am. I would be a softie. Uh, but I also have a sort of, you know, a sort of a mild OCD where I sort of, uh, you know, like to make decisions and stick by them. You yeah. Know? And, and it's the same in business. Have, you know, I've been lucky enough to fortune to start, you know, four businesses. And I don't do reunions there either. When we started the title newspaper in... Uh, in 1990, my decades mixed up, mixed, mixed up when you get to my age. 96, uh, I think. Six. Yeah. Um, I didn't go to the reunion in... in uh, Ten years later, um, even though I founded the paper, mm. um, it, I think it's a bit like going back and retracing steps. Um, certainly, with footballers, you know, everyone ages and everyone is. When you meet the guys, you know, you're, you, you know, there's a lot there. There's a lot of old memories there, but you know, you don't want to. You're not, you know, you, you've lived your own life since then, mm. and you've had a lot of experience that you haven't shared with those lads since then. Everyone has to get on with their life. Okay, you know. So, uh, well, I guess the attraction for a lot of those reunions is to almost, uh, to use the cliche, plug back in. It was like we were never separated. You'd all, all almost revert to twenty-five-year-olds, the same jokes, the same laughs, and maybe that's the appeal for some people. 
to yeah. go back into that atmosphere. But yeah, and a lot of lads like it, and I I, I understand that. I have no no problem yeah. with that. I mean, a lot of that it works for a lot of people. Uh, lads and girls it works for a lot of people um, it's not something that, that I need I mean I have my memories from that time yeah uh, and uh, you know mostly they're good memories you know you hold on to some of the bad memories too of some bad defeats but uh, by and large you don't need to you know you don't need to revisit uh, the group mm. um, you don't have much in common you really don't have much in common like you know at a point in time and I think I said to you when, when we chatted about Colm you know the reason the reason Mead footballers are on earth is to defeat Dublin. That's something that we've always believed. Some we, something that we, like, it's just fundamental to who we are, all right? And it's funny, I said it to you in that interview when we spoke last, and then the next day, Colm, I think, gave his first interview as Mead manager, and he said the exact same thing, and we hadn't even rehearsed it or haven't even <laughs> spoken about it. Um, so that's the reason why you're on life. You know, you, that's, that's where life is about. Mm. Um, but when you retire... And you're not part of the game anymore. You're, you have no skin in the game. You're never going to beat Dublin again. You know, you you don't have that much in common. It's a practicality. It's a, it's a it's just a fact. It's one of those, you know, obvious things. Yes. You know. A, a question I wanted to ask you. It's jumping in a bit at the deep end mm. here, if that's mm. okay. Mm. I was reading um, a piece uh, Dave Walsh uh, wrote a couple of years ago when he I'm bump into you in the street, mm. and he was reminiscing about the time he interviewed you the week of the 1987 All-Ireland Final against mm. Cork and the interview was over and he turned off his microphone and thanks very much and you said you haven't asked me about Jared, mm. which floored him. Mm. Jared, your brother who had died by suicide four years previously. Mm. Recording device went back on. You talked at length. It's published the Sunday morning at the All-Ireland Final. Mm. Uh, Meath win by six points. You get man of the match so it didn't affect you overly clearly. Mm. Uh, four years after his death, of all mornings, why that morning? I think it was a family thing. I mean, when you get to your first, like, when you are, are you know, a Gaelic footballer or hurler and you never imagine yourself, to begin with, you never imagine yourself playing in an All-Ireland final, right? Um, it's a dream, but it's, it's, it's never going to happen. For us in Mead, um, Ari, I mean, the, you know, the, for, for us in Mead, the aim was to beat Dublin. And we beat Dublin in, in the Leinster final in 1986. Now, we barely imagined that happening. So an All Ireland final was in the over beyond the distant mountains. It, it was way over there. Mm. Um, so when you finally get to one, it's like reaching the, a promised place. Uh, and it's not about you at that stage. It's, it is about your family. It is about everybody. You know what I mean? Because um, I mean, I, I came across photographs that a niece of mine sent me a few nights ago, and I had never seen them before. And there were loads of photographs of. Um, me eating breakfast at home and screen and uh, my mother had made me eggs and, and sausages and toast and uh, no bacon and and I was talking in the top of the table and around the table was my immediate family but uncles and aunts everybody's around the table um, and and then there was more photographs of me getting into the car and they all had balloons and they all had these big banners uh, it's you the know, morning of the final it's the morning of the all Ireland final and I'd never seen. I'd never even seen the banner before. It was something like uh, Cork will have Kerry, but they won't have Liam and Jerry. Me and Jerry <laughs> McIntyre. I'd never seen the banner before. Um, but to answer your question, this is like probably about we're meeting in Malahide, maybe uh, about nine o'clock, half nine, ten. Yeah. It's only like five or six hours before the game, but you're at home in the family atmosphere. You're not in a hotel. You haven't been sequestered the night before. In Mead, we'd always sleep in our own beds the night before an All Ireland final. So you're with all those people, and and you know so. I think for me that week it was about family and it was about um, the whole family and Jared was the missing member of our immediate family so it seemed natural to talk about him and I was surprised that David didn't ask me any questions about him. I mean, David was a pretty good journalist then and still is a pretty good journalist. You know, he was he was like, uh, think he was the best journalist in the country at that time and he sort of broke ground for a lot of people. I don't mind saying that because uh, we fell out then for about 10, 10 years and never spoke to David and myself. One of those foolish things, journalists like are, you know, are like kids in a the playground, they fall mm. out all the time. And um, yeah, to meet to meet David in the street that day was uh, was amazing and brilliant. It was, it, and to show that I am sort of sentimental. To meet him um, was great because David and David Walsh and I had had soldiered together as well. We had been on the same path in terms of GA. Yeah. We went down to Munster finals together. We both covered the Six Nations, the former Five Nations, for five or six years together. We'd meet up after every game and have dinner together. So we were very, very, very close. Mm. And we fell out for ten years. 
Was that over Michelle Smith? Oh God, it was over probably God knows, definitely Michelle. Yeah. Uh, and it could be other things. Right. Yeah. But Michelle would have been centre, centre, right, centre to it all. Yeah. And because I, I, I knew this in the background, but it's funny you go back I, even this week. I thought I must go back and actually see mm. who wrote what when. Mm. A lot of it seems to have just been erased from the internet. It's uh, curious. You were more in the pro. Let's not uh, yeah. jump to conclusions yeah. side here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people I felt jumped to conclusions, and also I felt a bit protective of of Michelle as well because I I felt I knew her better than any of the others. I wasn't in Atlanta. The Sunday Press didn't send me. I don't know why. Was it football or something? I opted out of a lot of uh, gigs as a journalist because I was playing football. Yeah. Um, and then when I started going to them, it didn't help at the end of my football career. Um, but um, yeah, I, I knew I knew Michelle and Eric pretty well. I mean, I'd interview them more than anybody else. I'd spent a lot of time with them and I understood what they were doing. I understood their training methodology. I understood why they were breaking new ground. And Michelle was spending more time in the gym than in the pool in terms of hours per week. She was... She was training uh, unlike most other swimmers. Um, so I knew a lot of facts and I felt a lot of other people didn't okay. because a lot of other people hadn't interviewed her, you know. Um, I tended to, I mean, as a journalist, I liked to interview the individual sports person a lot. I, I liked interviewing swimmers and boxers. I, you know, you felt you're really getting into a serious person who's yes. consumed by what they're doing. And uh, I always found Michelle interesting. We weren't friends by any means, mm. but I, I knew her pretty well. And how late in the day was it when you thought, oh, I think it's it's over a period of time, but you know, I, I felt that what I didn't like most was the manner, the aggressive, the aggressive manager manner in which I felt a lot of journalists attacked her. I mean, it happened literally, you know, pretty much before she got out of the water. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and I think they would say they had heard from people who had a keen eye and swimmers who yeah. looked at the progress and and would have said this is unlikely. Yeah, and there's a lot of you know, second and third hand sort of stuff then. So, I mean, it, it was a lot of, it was a lot of speculation. Um, but that, see, but I felt I, at I the that's time... Informed, that's informed speculation. I didn't feel it was. You know, like if you look at, say, for instance, the work that David did subsequently when he was, you know, tracking down Lance Armstrong. Yeah. That type of thing, where it's good gumshoe sort of work. Like, you know what I mean? It's really serious journalism at work. Um, I didn't feel that was at work in the initial stages with Michelle. I feel I felt it was innuendo. It was it was you know, you know comments from other swimmers. Uh, you know who knew what, who knew the facts, what were the facts, who knew what. I didn't feel there were any facts at that stage, and uh, I didn't feel there was any. And I'm not going back there. Look at three. <laughs> I didn't expect to turn. I didn't interview. feel there was any serious journalism at work in terms of in the initial condemnation of Michelle. Okay, difficult me for to defend it because I I can't read verbatim what was said, mm. but I would class talking to other swimmers who have, say, watched her career, mm. noted the improvements mm. and would have a, a very informed sense of what's possible, what's not possible. I, I, there's journalism in that and there's a bravery. I mean, mm. very easy to just say, all is great, let's mm. all sing Air on the Veen again. So mm. I think there's a bravery in actually calling it early, I suppose. Yeah, and, and perhaps there is. Uh, you know, I would differ. I would differ. Yeah. I think, that, you know, I think, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of nastiness at work between sports people as well and and um, you know um, it's it's um, it's uh, I gotta be careful what I say here yes. you know it's it's um, I, I don't you get to my age you know you look back on any of the relationships that you know that fell down um, because you had different beliefs and different things you know um, I was just saying to one of the guys earlier I mean you know um I fell out with Eamon Dunphy over something I can't even remember and I was in here one morning I don't know what I was doing in here I think we were both doing the papers or something mm. and we bumped into each other in the waiting room and we chatted for like half an hour 45 minutes and I'm just bygones or bygones um, but like we were sort of uh, you know we were sort of alleged enemies for you know 10 years right. and that type of thing so um, you know I think you know in those days you know you reach decisions on things and you were sort of digging your heels in and a lot of a lot of a lot of journalists can fall out, and still do because of you know because yeah. of beliefs. Like as a journalist, you know you're you're as strong as your beliefs, and your and your um, you know your your um, your ability to back up those beliefs. So you know you can you can you can you can sort of back yourself into certain places. Corner, yeah. Mm. Uh, do you miss sports writing in the newspapers? Uh, not much. No, I'm busy now with with 
publishing books. Yeah. So I'm I'm, re- I'm meeting um, I'm meeting so many writers now uh, that um, and watching them work and editing their work and encouraging them to write that I find that um, I find that enthralling and you know the country is just so full of so many good young writers you know um, it's a shame really because there's 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 not enough places not enough room for them to really showcase their skills um, like we've published you know, over 20 books last year mm. and we've published something like 60 books in the last three years plus so I'm not going to mention names I did an, I did a previously an interview and I don't want to mention names because I'm so proud of so many of our writers mm. but there's you know there's some writers who are I can mention one Arthur O'D from this parish off the ball don't mention him I have to mention him because he is uh, he is such a gifted writer um, and I mentioned Ty Coakley uh, in, in, in Cork. Mm. And these books Ty are... is just uh, the most phenomenal writer. Yeah, these books are local stories, uh, sports stories. Yeah, we yeah. tend to concentrate on... Um, we do national titles. Like, we, you know, we've, we've done, you know, Mike Ross and Kevin Walsh and, uh, you know, Kevin McStay. And, you know, we do a lot of, of national national books. But um, what we love most is, is to localise our, our publishing list. Um and there are so many great stories that are, you know, pertain to different communities that have never been written. Mm. Uh, I'm talking like, you know, for instance, say, you know, say David Clifford or uh, Henry Shefflin, you know, one of the iconic characters of their era, never actually wrote their story. And then it was 30, 40, 50 years passed and somebody turns up at the door and say, listen, let's, let's write your story. Let's, mm. let's remember your life. Let's put it on, in a book form. Um, and that's one like we have a lot of series. We have a Game of Life series, and we have a Flesh and Blood series, which is a family memoirs, um, and they're amazing books. Like we have Richie Power Senior and Junior this year as one of our family memoirs. So you have father and son, mm. you know, both Nicola Kenny Jersey, different generations, uh, and we dovetail their lives so you can you can you can read and experience both lives um, side by side, uh, and they're amazing books uh, to publish. Our Legend series, which I'm alluding to a second ago. Um, uh, that that's an amazing experience, Joe, because um, um, you're meeting a 60, 70, 80, probably 70, 80 year old person um, who was star material, who was top of the heap, who was David Clifford once upon a time. So when I speak, when I'm talking to some of these characters and I'm asking them to say, consider, let us publish your life story. What I say, to, what, what I do say to them is, um, okay, you've been in some dressing rooms in your life. Let me bring you to this dressing room. I'm going to open the door, right, and I'm going to bring you in, and I'm going to show you who's in here. And over there, you've got Eric Skeels. Seven hundred games for Stoke City. Over there, you've got Barry Murphy. Seven hundred games for Barnsley. Over there, you've got Tony Parks. Three hundred and fifty games for Blackburn. Kenny Dalglish's assistant when they won the Premier League. Six times caretaker manager. Over there, you've got Len Gaynor and Mick Jacob, two of the most sophisticated, stylish wing backs in hurling history. Tony O'Sullivan, he's over there in the corner. Mm. Kerry's first All Star, the most amazing, intellectual, brilliant person I've ever met. Lectured all over the U- the US on Irish on Irish history. And you got more. You got over there. You got Mickey Whelan, and Jimmy Gray, mm. two of the iconic figures in Dublin. And up here behind me, you got Paddy Doherty, greatest fo- forward of the sixties. Down captain in sixty one when they won the All Ireland. But but Paddy Doherty, Paddy Moe was Gooch Cooper and David Clifford in one. He was untouchable. Mm. So I bring this person in, I say, Okay, this is your dressing room. This is where you're gonna spend the rest of your life. Now let's publish your book and sit over there. And and that's the real I'm not trying to be over dramatized it, that's the reality of it. You know what I mean? In that room we've got fifteen, twenty guys already, um, who are teammates forevermore. Mm. And um, and why wouldn't you want to be in that dressing room? So, you know. <clears throat> that photo you mentioned of All-Ireland Morning. Yeah. What's uh, so interesting in that same piece I mentioned that Dave Walsh wrote just two or three years ago is he mentions your mother, Margaret, sent him a letter. Mm-hmm. And on the Saturday night, she drove to Dublin, bought an early copy of the Sunday paper. Yeah, we were always doing that read it under the street lights of the GPO to yeah. see what her son had to say about her other son. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is such an arresting image. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? I love that image. And, and I'd, I'd somewhat forgotten about that. That's one of the, one of the gifts that my uh, bumping into David gave me uh, because he brought that image back. Do you remember your mother saying to you, 
No, because they did it all the time. You see, in, in those days, there was no internet. There was, you know, there was no sure. internet. There was no immediate access to any media. So, if you knew, not even if I gave an interview, um, families would from Mead would go up to Dublin, normally the GPO, yeah, and buy their Sunday papers so they could read about the match the next day. It'd be the first edition of the paper of the Sunday papers. Yeah. Um, but they wanted to get there fast, so they'd be up in Dublin. And my mum and dad would do that all the time right, okay. before an extra final or an All Ireland final. But I'd forgotten that they would have done it before that All Ireland, and I'd forgotten they would have done it, um, especially because I, they would have known that I'd spoken to David Walsh, and I would have alerted my mother, especially, to the fact that um, that I'd spoken to, to David about Jared. Yeah, you know. Was she pleased that you had? Oh, she's delighted. Yeah, I mean, she loves me. She lo- She lo- You know, I've. I've I have a difficulty talking to my mother about Jordan. Over the years, um, I wasn't very responsive whenever she brought him up. And it's like we're talking about 30, 40 years. Yeah. It's just something I can't do. Um, physically, I can't do. It's, there must be some PTSD form of something going on because I never got therapy you know, after Jared died. Um, you know, I'm 21 and I find the body in our local football field and uh, I never did therapy. You know what I mean? And I, I, I should have done it and I still would benefit from it. Mm. Um, uh, I actually am having my first therapy session on Tuesday. Not because of that, but I've, it's always something I've wanted to do. Um, so, because uh, I'd closed off a lot. So, um, with Jared, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's. I can talk to you about it and I can talk to, to uh, David Walsh about it. But if I'm talking to my mother, uh, emotions come in that I get very tight and uh, different emotions come in that I don't like. Uh, all about the scene and the happening and the event and his, you know, taking of his own life um, because he took his own life in a horrific manner. Um, and so you, you don't want to go back there with her, unfortunately. And it's funny, myself, my dad, uh, I've said this once before, like, you know, um, the 20 years after Jared died, before my dad died, uh, he survived Jared by 20 years. Like, we never spoke about Jared once. I never brought Jared up with him and he never brought Jared up with me. And that's the Irish male at work. Do you know what I mean? Or the male generally at work, you know what I mean? And women are different and a mother is different. Uh, but yeah, I couldn't be there for my mum, which is a, is a pity, but there's nothing I could do about it. But I could do it in other ways. And I think, giving you an awful long answer here. No, keep Me talking. talking to David Walsh uh, about it that, that, um, um, in that Sunday morning of the All-Ireland Final was me, you know, probably reaching out to her uh, and nobody else really, reaching out to her. So it was great he mentioned the GPO because I had forgotten that yeah. she would have been up under the lights. And, and she's a small little woman. If you knew my mum, she's f- about four foot ten. She's a tiny little woman uh, and, the, and the bravest, happiest woman you'll ever find. She's still alive, Lee. Yeah, she is, yeah. Yeah, yeah she's 92, 93 now. Right. And uh, just to, to have the image of her at four foot ten uh, under the lights of the GPO reading, probably in the car, but reading, she probably would have read it very, very quickly, I yeah. would imagine. Would she have gone to the match the next day? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And watch your other son win in All-Ireland. And yeah, and the, the fact that I won man yeah. of the match. I mean, that was one of the rare All-Irelands that I, you know, I have to say, like, um, um, you know, it, was, it wasn't the greatest match. Uh, it was an interesting match because Cork dominated the first 20 minutes and should have won the match, could have closed the door on us. Yeah. There was two moments we scored a, um, a lucky goal, a fortunate goal, and they had a goal chance just before then and the game could have run away from us and then we dominated the last 50 minutes and Cork caved. It wasn't a great match. Any one of, I mean this, I'm delighted they've got man of the match. It's nice to see it in the history books, but any one of 10 me players could have got man of the match that day. God, um, thankfully, um, mm. um, the old Galway footballer's name, I can't remember. Um, he was analyst in RT at the time, right. one, three in a row. Uh, gave it to me, and I'm not sure why. But uh, he met my mum coming out of the ground. And I don't know how he even knew my mum. She must have said hello to him. That would be her style. End of collaring excuse me, and the Collins family. Um, and he said, I gave it to your young fella. So it was great. Wow. Yeah. What a moment for... And the funny thing was, when the award was being given out in the hotel in Malahide that night, my mum and dad were the only two who knew who the winner was. Okay. But there, well, because there was eight or nine lads who could have won it and had a real belief that they should have won it, uh, there was other mothers and fathers saying, yeah, it's room that my son has it. I, actually, I think, it's, I think he, he has. I think my son has it. And my mum s- stood there, didn't say a word, because mm. she'd heard from the uh, from the horse's mouth exactly who'd won it. So yeah. Uh, the most interesting word you used there is that you you said I physically, physically couldn't mm. engage. Oh yeah, no, it's a physical thing. It's not a mental thing. 
Nice. You know, it's like a it's like a physical thing. Like you just can't engage. You know what I mean? Um, Leave the room. No, I would just end the conversation. I, I wouldn't. I, uh, I wouldn't give anything back. She would get nothing back from me, and she would know it after about sixty seconds. Yeah, yeah. And where so that your mum? I mean, strength of character there to, for her to revisit it and talk about it. Oh, she's great, but she does that all the time, Joe. I mean, we, she's a book at home called her her, her her sad book, where she has worked with two, three hundred families all over Ireland. She she um, uh, she mentors them and, and helps them. Uh, they come to her and she travels to them. So she's done that for the last 30, 40 years. Is she qualified or just I've been there, I've done it, no, talk no. to me? And there's about, there literally is about two, three hundred families in her, her sad book, as we call them. Yeah. What a legacy. And like suicide is such an, you know, it's, it's epidemic levels always has been, still is. Um, uh, and people generally don't talk about it too much. Um, but so they would come to her because she has been, you know, had been very outspoken about it and had, you know, had, had been a lot of programs about it. So people would know of her. Yes. Um, what do you suspect was going on with your late father during those years where your mother is, is almost counselling anyone who needs it and, and your father can't mention the name to his... Yeah, he would be supportive of her, but he wouldn't want to talk about it himself, you know, and certainly not to me. And I certainly wouldn't want to talk to him. I mean, you know, he would travel... The screen matches, our club matches, you know, I normally, you know, was living at home as one of those Irish guys. I lived at home till I got married at 28, so I was living at home most of my career. Right. My dad would go to most matches with me and, uh, you know, we, we would never talk about that. But I think it's like, it's, it's, it's like something um, when you, like, the football field in, in screen where Jar died is about 400 yards from our house. So it was our playground. We would be there every day of our lives. Uh, and um, so by road, it's about 400 yards. Or you can go to the bottom of our of our, our garden at home at Screen and you can go across the field, which the journey Jared took that night when he took his life. Um, and you can reach the football field by about 200 yard dash, right? Um, so, like for me at this at, at that stage, when Jared died in 83, uh, this is, Bo- Sean Bowen is just coming into the Mead setup. Mead aren't likely to win anything. I spoke to you a moment about like, there was no thought of even beating Dubliner. We'd lost the previous first round, the previous three Leinster championships, so Mead were at zero. Mm. Um, so, but for me, it was about screen. It was about the football pitch. It was about the blue jersey of screen. Um, so, I mean, I had a decision to make. You know, was I going to go back to that field um, to play for screen, to train for screen, um, uh, and that's what I decided I had to do. So, I mean, I did that for ten years. You know, on dark nights and bad nights and windy, rainy nights, the same sort of night in which I would have found Jared in that field. But I made the decision that I had to, um, I think I made the decision I had to literally um, put what happened in, in, a, in a box and, and, and close, literally close it and lock it and put it away. Because I had to physically, like in rural Ireland at that stage and, and uh, particularly, you know, in the 80s, there was no money in the country. You know, you, there wasn't a lot. Uh, and if you were playing football and enjoying your football in rural Ireland then, or hurling, and that was your life. So um, very hard to walk away from it, uh, no matter what happens. So I decided, you know, I, I have to be here. So to do that, you know, I'm being an amateur psychologist now, um, to do that, I think you have to really lock something away. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and, and I'm guessing that's what I did, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's the irony of all ironies that you, you try and box it away and then you're confronted with it several times a week at that pitch. Yeah, I mean, it was in, it was lucky in the second half of my career with the Mead, uh, when Mead started being successful. You know, Mead consumed like 80, 90 percent of my career then. So you know, you'd be training with Mead, playing with Mead, and you'd only play with your club for a, a yeah. tiny amount of time. So you'd only be back in the in the pitch in that environment, um, you know, for about a month or two Yes. every year. But in the immediate uh, years after Jared died, you were down there um, you know, two or three times a week and you were playing games and, you know, attacking that goal or defending that same goal. And so you had to lock it away. Otherwise, you you, know, you physically wouldn't be able to, um, you wouldn't be able to do it. You know what I mean? Mm. So have you, I mean, it's 40 years now that you say 83, mm. Mm. 23. You haven't, by the sense of things, cultivated a, a private or spiritual relationship with him. Or with with Jared? Sort of talk to him? No, no. Uh, no, I haven't, and um, it's it's um, and it's strange because after my career ended, I stopped going to obviously I stopped going to to screen football pitch. I mean, I've never been back there in twenty thirty years. 
Um, and we'll never, you know, it's not where I, I, I plan to go back. Yeah. Uh, I brought my David, my young, my eldest son, a couple of times down there when he was a young kid uh, to, to kick the ball around. But I've never gone back for matches or events or, you know, functions. Um, so that's quite obvious. You know, I'm just not going to go back there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's something you've locked away. You've, you've brought yourself far away from it. You've locked things away. Um, like Jared left a lot of diaries. I said this before, he left a lot of diaries uh, and I've never visited them. I've never taken them up. Uh, I was admonished in one interview once when I said that, that, for, you know, well, you know, why don't you? You should do that. Um, um, why haven't you? I've never felt the need to. I've never felt the need to. I think it's going to, uh, I'm going to read things I'm not going to want to, I'm not going to want to read. Um, About his... Am I scared? Am I cowardly? Probably a little bit. Um, am I unfair to him? Definitely. Uh, I know if I took my own life and I left writings, I'd imagine I'd be, you know, you'd want people to read them. Um, but uh, it's not something that I ever felt uh, I, I I could do or wanted to do. As in your, um, <clears throat> and by the way, don't answer any, any of these questions if you don't want to. They're no. unbelievably personal. Are you terrified you'll read of his sadness or his depression or his rationale behind his... Yeah, I, m- mainly I think, um, you know, I think I'm not, I'm not talking across the board here. I mean, people have taken their own lives for all sorts of reasons. So mm-hmm. I'm talking about Jared. Yeah. So I'm not looking to to um, to insult or to Generalize. be unfair to yeah. other families yeah. who lost loved ones by suicide. OK, I'm talking about Jared's case. In, in my view, you know, Jared obviously was disturbed. Uh, he obviously he was suffering, you know, severe mental health issues, in my view. Um, my mother and others in my family mightn't agree with that. That's my view. And um, um, it wasn't quite obvious to us. Uh, it never is with a suicide in, in, in a lot of cases. Um, if we had read his his diaries at the time, maybe we would have learned a lot. Um, but I think that's what the diaries will bring me. They'll bring me to places where I think I'm reading my brother writing in a disturbed manner about life in general and about his life. And I mean, I mean I'm aware of what's in them. I mean, I, I, I um, you know, uh, I've never read them, but I, I was I was I was present when somebody was reading something in them once, and it was something like three months before he died. He was saying, "I still can't believe I haven't, you know, I'm still here." That this type of thing. So, you know, it's not something that um, uh, it's not something I can I can ever see myself wanting to read. Yeah, I because I think you know your own brother. Like we shared the same bedroom together for twenty years. Uh, and um, you know, two twin twin, twin beds in a in a small room in rural Ireland. So, you know, we knew each other very well. We played football three or four hours a day every day together. He was four years older than me, mm. so normally I lost, but um, um, but uh, we played every day together. So you know, I knew him. I knew I know the brother I had. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I have fantastic memories of him. Um, you know, when you know when I was a kid and. You know, needed protection at times, and he wasn't a great protector because he was sort of, sort of individual, uh, in 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 his own way within the family. Um, but you know, he was a he was a big brother, and he was a he was a good brother, um, and he was there for me when I needed him. So I don't need to go back and find out, you know, you know what was happening. Yes. Uh, maybe in the years before he died. Did you suspect there was trouble in the years before he died? No, not at all. Not at all. No. Um, but. Uh, but funny, I mean, strange, you know, when he went missing that Sunday night, um, he went missing around eight or nine o'clock. And I say missing, like in rural Ireland, we we were a non-drinking family. My, you know, my parents are pioneers, so we would never be in the pub. Um, you know, I went through my whole career without drinking, obviously. Mm. Uh, so it was easy for me to be a meat footballer. <laughs> I was one of the few. Um, so, you know, you weren't going to be many places in rural Ireland if you went, you know, where were you? You know, where, where is he? So we didn't, Within half an hour, an hour, we knew there was a problem. We okay. knew something was wrong. You know what I mean? And then five, six hours later, we found his body. But we instantly knew. So it was like something was there. Like you knew, maybe, maybe you know, you felt, maybe you felt more than you, that you than you were aware of. Interesting. Mm. Uh, your first thought was he might have self harmed as opposed to traffic accident. You mean? Yeah, he didn't drive. He wouldn't have been anywhere. You know? Yeah. I mean, Jared was a, a bit of a loner. He didn't have. He didn't have. Um, he didn't have many or any friends in uh, in screen. He played football, uh, but he wasn't pally with anybody. He wouldn't have been in anyone's house. Yeah. Mm. So, um, aside, 
family very difficult to talk about it mm. with mm. journalists. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, that's the terrible thing uh, about it. Yeah, friends, teammates, like who, who have you talked to about it away from? Nobody, no, only journalists would ever ask me about it. Teammates would never would never talk about it, never did talk about it. Yeah. I mean, Sean Boylan brought the team down to screen, down to our parish to, to train on one occasion before one all Ireland or something. One night he brought the lads. I don't know why he did it. He brought the whole team to screen. And uh, at the end of the session, I went up to him and said, listen, you should never do that again. You know what I mean? Don't never bring the lads here because they weren't part of my life. Yes. They weren't part of that. It was a screen thing. The screen lads, the screen team, uh, were part of that, not the mead lads. And to have the mead lads on the on the pitch and screen uh, was awful. It, it really was like head spinning for me. Um, they were they were invading my life. Mm. You know what I mean? And almost it sounds like mead is your refuge, and never the twins yeah, shall meet. Yeah, I'm not sure, Joe. It was something like that. They shouldn't have been there. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That type of thing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's a, it's funny because. <laughs> The advice to everyone is to talk about it as much as possible, and yeah. you've you've taken a different route. And who knows? I, look, I'm I'm not a professional. I don't know what the right route is. Mm. Are, are you? Do you have regrets that you've taken the route you've taken? Has it affected your life in a negative way, or or do you feel it's so awful and traumatic that you're content enough not to have had to delve into it? Yeah, no, I am. I'm, no, I I am. I'm, I'm I'm very content with my with my decisions, and that's. I mean, once you experience, and this I'm speaking for anybody who's been through. Um, I think a, 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 a violent, the loss of somebody in a violent way, right? Yeah. Uh, whether it's a suicide or a murder or whatever, you're 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 far more aware of the vulnerability of people, um, and so you're always thinking of of suicide. I mean, you're, every day you're thinking of suicide. You're thinking of of your own vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, your own mental health. Mm. You know, you're always conscious of that. You know, would you know would you ever do that? You know, to, to your loved ones. How would you? you know, how did? No, you never would. So you're always aware. You're always thinking. You're always aware of the more of your own immediate family uh, and watching them. Uh, um, it's 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 uppermost in your mind. I mean, it's it's there all the time. You know what I mean? And that's the same for every family who has suffered. Like you, you're aware all the time of um, you know everyone around you and and how they're doing. And uh, and it's a fear. It's a fear you live with all the time, especially for younger people in your family, because you know suicide claims young and old. Um, but it claims a you know, terrifying number of, of young people yeah. who, I don't know, I always think it's more tragic than older people. Uh, you know, they, they just don't know. Um, something can happen. Something can flick a switch. It's not the end of the world. It's not a, you know, it's, it's not the end of their life. It's not defining. But young people um, uh, taking their own life is, is just, it's just the ultimate tragedy. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's just it's desperately sad. No, I wasn't expecting to talk. No, I'm sorry. Th- no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine talking to you about it, and it's important, and I'm happy. And what makes me happy, um, um, I'm not talking about it on a personal level because again, don't take this wrong. Maybe because it's helped for me, or it's it's gratifying anyway for me. But I, I like, I don't mind getting the message out there because there's a lot of people who. Who, who you need to know that it is uh, something that is at epidemic levels. It is something that can hit, hurt any family. Um, it is something that people should be aware of all the time within families. Um, and and most people assume it'll, it'll never, yes. you know. So that's why I like talking to you about it. I didn't think we'd talk about it for half an hour. Yes. But no, no, and I'm happy to keep talking. But um, it, it's not for me or my family that we've been here and we've you know, we've moved on with our lives. But it, when you ask me about it, um, it's important to talk about it to people. So if anybody listens and hears, you know, that you can recover from it, there's a way in which you can move on with your life. Yeah. Uh, it's devastating, but you can live a full life. You can enjoy your life, uh, you know, whether it's a parent or whether it's a sibling. And they're important. It's important for people to know that, you know. Yes. What effect will us talking like this for 20 plus minutes have on you I'm conscious you said there's almost a physical reaction when your mother tries to bring it up with you will you have a difficult evening now yeah and it'll leave me off kilter <laughs> in a small way not in a dramatic way but it'll leave me off kilter because I've sort of uh, um, sort of divest, you know divested yes. myself yes. but not in, in a good way I'm saying, it's no drama attached I'm just happy that, that uh, 
first I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about it okay. with you and I have to say that first and foremost because it's an important message to get out there you know that um, that um, uh, it's an awful thing that is, is very very common you know well, I say this on the record, if there's any part of that conversation you would prefer not to go out on the radio or on podcast, just say the word and it goes no further than just No, this I'm happy, Joe. And if, but again, likewise, if there's anything I've said that you or your, or your team feel might be inappropriate, you know, that, you know, as I say, and uh, you know. No, it's your experience. You know. You're getting therapy on Tuesday. Unofficially. I, yeah. <clears throat> I'm meeting a friend, uh, somebody who and and um, so, yeah, I'm just going to do one session. A therapist yeah. who is a friend? Uh, someone I've met, yeah. OK. Yeah. And it's, so. what's it about? <laughs> don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going but to sit down and talk. You've an interest in exploring. I've always wanted to do it. And I felt that. And this, again, it's an important message. I never I never went into, like, I never went into therapy afterwards. Um, and I should have. I don't know what would have changed. Uh, but I would say to anybody out there who has experienced any, you know, has had experience, uh, you know, of a, of a, a violent death, uh, you know, that you, know, sh- you should seek help. You should seek professional counselling. Why wouldn't you? Um, you should go there and do it, you know. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, because like I was sort of swept away on, on, a, on a brilliant journey as a mead footballer. And my mother always says to me, thank you f- for your career. If we didn't have your career. Uh, we all would have been lost because they all went on that journey with me. Do you know what I mean? It was like, uh, you know, suddenly me, suddenly me team came alive. Mm. That the, not that summer, Jared died because we were beaten by Dublin in the first round of the Leinster Championship in 1983 after a replay. That was the Dublin team that won the All-Ireland and people are talking about it last week going down to Cork and beating Pork, Cork and Porky O'Keefe. Uh, we had Dublin beaten twice that summer in the first round of the championship. They beat us after a replay. Um, and we didn't have the confidence to beat them. We didn't think we deserved to beat them, basically. You get what you deserve. What you, you get what you believe you deserve in sport. That's the one thing I've, I've always... You know, the, the small... I mean, when you talk about Mayo and Dublin in recent years, you know, Dublin believe they deserve it. Mayo, do they really think they deserve it? I don't think they do sometimes. And there's the little subtleties in terms of how games... You know, um, I was looking to talk to Jim Gavin recently on a private level, and... I was asking and I was saying to him about the, all the one point wins and like a one point win is a sign of, of, of a really strong team yeah. mentally a really strong group of guys you win games by one point win a good few big games at one point it's a, it's a sign of, of a really impressive group of people mm. you know in my view sorry I'm not sure what I was talking about there you were I, saying me then that wonderful magical journey was almost like a life raft yeah you. it was sorry my mum and my mum always says that um, because then in 84 we got to our first Leinster final won the Centenary Cup, which was a f- fantastic competition celebrating the centenary of the GA. Mead won that in, 80, yeah. in 80, 84. In 85, we were dumped out of the Leinster Championship by Leash by 10 points down in Tullamore. And it all cliff edge. They tried to get rid of Sean Boyle, and luckily they didn't. There was a push against Sean. Hmm. He held on. And then 86, 87, 88, um, 89, 90, we had five fantastic years where... Um, yeah. I've heard you, uh, the, the words you to describe, you use to describe Sean Boylan are interesting. Mm. You use words like um, otherworldly, magical, mm. uh, like a mystic mm. c- character in your mm. world. Yeah, yeah, because he wasn't a football man. Uh, he knew, as we understood it, he knew nothing about football when he became manager. He was a hurler. Uh, he played hurling for Meath. Uh, if you're a hurler in Meath, you are... In a small, uh, <laughs> sort of unknown, underprivileged community. I mean, when I say that, I'm not knocking them because, you know, there's a lot of good, honest hurlers yeah. in Mead. You knew they existed, you just never met one of them. Well, when I worked in the Mead Chronicle, when I started my, job, my, my career as a journalist, yeah. I worked in the Mead Chronicle and I served my apprenticeship there for five years as a sports journalist and a news journalist. But for two years, because I was playing football, uh, I didn't want to report on football matches. I covered Mead club hurling for two years. But I can safely say, probably, like, no Mead footballer has ever seen a Mead hurling game, club game, or has ever seen Mead play. I mean, football people don't go to see hurling games in Mead. Mm. So, um, most people in Mead have never gone to a club hurling game in their lives, and have never gone to see Mead play hurling in their lives. So, Sean Boyling came from that, that unknown 
grouping <laughs> and he's managing us. Do you know what I mean? There are me hurling people listening right now saying, Liam, we get it. Yeah, well. <laughs> Labour the point. Well, Jerry McIntyre, my old teammate, was at a was at, was at a meet and he had apologised to the poor man afterwards. He had a meet county board convention a few years back talking about meet football. He was invited to say something and at the end of the meeting, uh, a woman from a hurling club said, what about the hurlers, Jerry? And Jerry said, get all the sticks and burn them. <laughs> and he got a round of, <laughs> a round of applause. But, uh, and he apologised to the poor woman <laughs> afterwards, but it does, that is pretty much the, the mindset of a lot of mead football people, they just don't think about hurling. Okay. But the point is that Sean Bowling came from that group. Mm. The year before he was mead manager, he was in our dressing room in screen uh, before a county final. And he was literally the masseur and bandaging up the odd cut. Right? So that's what, that was Sean Bowling, that was the person we knew. Mm. Literally going around the screen dressing room, rubbing legs and looking after someone's bloody nose. But nobody's asking him what he thought about the match, all right? Um, and then suddenly this guy is, is, is made football manager. I mean, so he had to have some, he had to have some amazing uh, wizardry. He had to have some special skills as a person uh, to win over anybody. You know what I mean? He had to, he had to have something, and he had God, he had it in spades. But he wasn't a football man. He was never a football person. You know, I, I never thought he had a he had a brilliant football knowledge, but he was a brilliant people person, and he was he was he was brilliant at at understanding lads, and he was brilliant at getting guys to understand themselves and to achieve more and to be more. Mm. Um, and that really was his great skill, mm. you know. Um, and he would live with us. I mean, he would live at all the families. He would be in your home till two or three o'clock in the morning. He'd be in your house. At every event, like you know, we all got to know Sean as a friend. Uh, so it was a friend more than a football manager. It was very strange. It's not something that you would see, you know, nowadays. So how he worked was was he was a, he was a, he was um, again, not trying to be over dramatic. He was some character from Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You know, he was one of those wizards. Whether it was grey or white, more white than grey. You know what I mean? In terms of you know, uh, he he was one of those wizards. And um, I think anyone who's met him, yeah. It's hard to put your finger on it, but he has. He has hard to put your finger on. I mean, yeah, I could meet Sean and he talked to me for twenty minutes, and I go away. So, what was he talking about? Like, sometimes Sean can be hard to understand. He could talk in, in riddles. And you say, I should be on the phone to Sean for twenty minutes, and I have no idea what he's talking about. Mm. Right? Mm. Um, <laughs> but he's been telling you something. What I'm saying, he he is he is he is uh, yeah he's 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 a he's a wizard. Yeah. Uh, and the amazing thing is, uh, well, maybe not amazing because it was a different era, but it is quite generous of him that he never stood in the way of your journalism mm. career. I mean, you've talked about writing not just about your own dressing room, not just about the opposition, but even in the build up to huge games, you mm. do a profile piece of Sean Boylan. In it, you're critical of Sean Boylan. Mm. You give it to Sean Boylan uh, in advance to read. He doesn't change a word and says, go for it. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot there that most uh, mere mortals would say, Liam, there's not a chance any of this is happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that gives, you, that gives you a beautiful insight to a different time, different place in Ireland, different yeah. time, place in the GA. You know, like as writers, you didn't have to ask anyone's permission to interview a player. You know, when David Walsh interviewed me before the All-Ireland Final, I didn't tell that Sean Boyle or anybody I was appearing in the Sunday Tribune. Yeah. They would have picked up the Sunday Tribune and seen an interview with me or David Beggy or whoever. Uh, and nobody was cut, so nobody was... First of all, nobody knew you were going to be talking to a journalist, mm. and nobody knew nobody. So nobody's going to coach you as to what to say. It was free for all. When you were writing about me and playing for me, what was the most critical things you would have said? And it was a lot of it was all about Dublin and and, and Mead, like you know, because we were it was just Dublin and Mead every year. Yeah, but I mean, critical of Mead. Of would you have said we're not going well in training? So and so's not putting it in. He's yeah. out of form. Yeah, and that's why then and now and since, and I don't write anymore. And I mean, Kerry people, for instance, thought it was very hard on them for a few years. People in Kerry would say, oh, you're a terrible heart on us and the naughties. Um And I can honestly say to anybody, you know, you know, I was hardest on myself and my teammates in the Mead dressing room. Mm. You want to you wanna see harsh words? I'll show you what I wrote about the Mead team. So uh, they're the standards I'm holding you up to. You know, I'm not going to take a step back in my in my analysis of, of Kerry football. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be as hard on Kerry football as I would be on Mead so what on would the Mead team when what, I was there so, what would your teammates say? Uh, some lads would get a little bit vexed and some lads would feel uh, that you were um, um, maybe letting the side down a little bit I mean, but I got too used to it because they knew I was always going to be writing 
about the next match. So they always knew I was going to be writing about the match. Do you know what I mean? Um, when my book Out of Our Skins came out in 92, you know, that I think uh, caused a little bit more offence to a couple of guys. I was finishing up in 92. At 28, I decided I was going to retire at 30 because I'd been on the team playing with Mead since I was 16, minor, under 21, senior. I'd been there like 10, 12 years. Uh, suddenly I was um, married. I had two young kids. Um, we'd won it enough. We were we were getting tired. You could see the team breaking down. Mm. Uh, life was life as a footballer was becoming a bit of a hardship. Um, and uh, I made in my mind at 28 I was getting out at 30. So I knew I was getting out in, in 1992. So at the start of 1990, 1991, seasons were split then over winter and, and not like they are now. So at the start, at the start of the 1991-92 season, um, I had made my mind up to retire. And that's when I decided to ride out of our skins. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, a couple of lads were, were you know, took offence and a couple of players in the team. It's hard for me to name them. I don't want to name them because sure. uh, they might say, oh, I didn't take offence. They did. The couple of lads in the team stopped talking to me uh, that, that season. Um, certainly weren't going to pass the ball to me. They weren't going to be polite. <laughs> so, uh, and Sean Boylan put up with that, God bless him. It's a strange dynamic. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of our, one of our, uh, one of our, um, yeah, one of our best forwards uh, was very unhappy with me. Um, so, with good reason, perhaps, perhaps. But I'm doing my job. Like you know, I'm I'm sort of a split personality. I'm a full time journalist and I'm a full time footballer. And if one Bo- is talking about the other. If you know? Boylan had said to you, pick one. Oh, it, it would have been journalism because, yeah, I mean, it was my it was my career, and you know, it was it was what I loved doing. You know, w- was winning in All Ireland everything you dreamt and hoped it would be? Uh, it was, but it was. Um, it comes back to Dublin, you know, beating Dublin. The big game, the, the games you'll always remember, the games beating, uh, beating Dublin. Why do you, hate you can't beat Dublin in all Ireland. Why, why do you hate Dublin so much? Uh, because we, we so because I think when you're growing up in me, like, you know, Dublin is the big city. Mm. Uh, it's the big, noisy place. Uh, um, you get to know Dublin teams. Um, so in the 70s, when we were watching Dublin and Kerry in Mead, we were all shouting for Kerry, obviously, uh, not Dublin. Uh, we were all Kerry fans um, and we would be broke, heartbroken when, when if Dublin beat Kerry. Mm. Um, so that's the way you were brought up. Uh, and so it's a me thing and, and it goes back generations. It goes back to the 60s. Uh, it goes back way before my generation that there was, there was a me Dublin thing. Me, me Dublin had a special rivalry uh, and there was an, in, uh, there was an intense uh, dislike, dislike between the two. I think Dublin had a lot of respect for Mead. More, uh, Mead had a lot of respect for Dublin but Dublin didn't fear Mead. Mead feared Dublin, but Mead knew they would turn the tables on Dublin. Uh, they would get their chance. It's like, you know, they would get their chance to land a, the, to, to land a blow on Dublin's chin. They always knew they would. Uh, and they'd wait their time. And sometimes they'd wait 10 years, but they always wait their time. But they knew they'd get it, you know. And those are the matches that remain. Uh, they're the fondest matches. We won two All-Irelands and we lost two All-Irelands. Yeah. Um, um, but they... Um, they um, they're like big celebrations, big fair days. They're like big uh, events a wedding or something weird and all learn a final you know what I mean a big sort of event mm. whereas Dublin is, was the daily bread that's what it was all about you know mm. what I mean mm. um, I presume when people ask you how's your health they ask it with a certain uh, weightiness so uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma mm-hmm. 2010 mm-hmm. Uh, it was stage one it was stage three went away came back I, 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 I'm I half read it can hang around. It's a it's a stubborn. Yeah, it can it can hang around. There's different forms. Uh, it can it can it can be sort of follicular, which means it's sort of it's always there type of thing. I've been very lucky. Uh, I had it in 2010 for oh nine ten. Um, so in treatment like for two years, then it went away. Came back in 15. So I was in treatment 15, 16, 17. So I was in treatment for about five years out of eight um, in St James's, where you meet. You know, I think it's only when you have a serious illness that you understand the health service and, and, and workers in the health service and yeah. just how how amazing these people are. And it sounds a cliche, uh, but, you know, you get you get seriously sick and um, and you go in and watch them. And I mean watch them. Like, you go into St. James's for a day's um, treatment, you're probably going to go in and sit down in a waiting area for an hour or two while they're you know, doing your bloods and checking your, your files and everything. And then you'll go to uh, another seated area maybe for another hour, an hour and a half. Um, where there might be a television or might not and then you go into your treatment room you know 
uh, eight chairs, eight big blue armchairs, and you're going to be there for three, four, five hours. Mm -hmm. So you're in St. James like for 10, 10, maybe 10 hours. So you're watching people, and you're watching the staff. You read for a while to pass the time, but that that's becomes tiresome. So you're watching the staff, and you're watching people. And, and the thing that, what I, the, you know, I sort of lost a decade because of that illness, because when I look back on it now, I realise I, I, was, I was beaten up mentally. Only now, when you look back, that you realise what, what you were, you know, yeah. mentally where you were. I was, and I was beaten up mentally in that I thought, you know, uh, from a career point of view, from a business point of view, I'm not going to, I never imagined I'd be publishing 20, 30 books a year and that your books would be doing what it's doing now. Um, so you are in a tough place, but you don't realise at the time, but you do watch these people and you do watch the nursing staff and the doctors uh, and everybody. And um, you're like people watching, yeah. and uh, it's and and they're amazing. And the thing about St James's in those five years, which um, is really important to say, is that not only is it an amazing place with amazing people, you're in a sanctuary almost. Like in my time in there, and you're surrounded by people, young and old, with varying degrees of of, of cancer, some very ill, um, some terminal, uh, some fighting, and absolute quietness. You know the movie The Silent Place, the, 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 the great um, movie that's been out in recent years where you can't speak, there's no noise. In St James's when I was there uh, all those years, the silence uh, and the calmness, nobody shouting, nobody bitching, nobody complaining, nobody. All the, all, all the patients are there and they're waiting and there's just perfect calm. And it's the most amazing, I, I've never experienced it, but for those five years, every single time I was in there, there was this calmness. Mm. Nobody shouted. Then you go into the car park, get back in your car, get on the road, and you have all the mayhem of of life. People acting like imbeciles. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But you go into this place, and people who should be shouting and roaring uh, are just are just beautifully calm. Sanctuary. Oh, amazing, amazing! Like never. Five years, I never heard one person shout. Not one person shout. Like you think they would you think something would go wrong and somebody would shout at somebody you know do you make friends with any of their patients uh, uh, not really uh, not really if you'd get to know everyone you'd get to know faces or is it a bit like the tube no eye contact it's a bit That's... like that it's a bit like that it's a bit like that um, because everyone's in, caught up in their own war almost. yeah there was one man I knew and, and uh, I want to want to mention his name um, I knew him from outside and I saw him in the, in the blue chair he was in the blue chair beside me um, one day and uh, I should have gone over to him and said hello to him but I wanted to give him his privacy because I hadn't seen him before and he was at, I think he was having his early early treatment uh, early chemo um, but he committed suicide about a month later and that I regret um, you know what if, I, if I'd gone over to him um, but um, at the time I made a decision no I, I, you know, I'll see him again mm. so um, uh, yeah that would be a regret I, I wouldn't have talked to too many people but again I think everyone sort of observes yes you know, the, you know, the rules I, I mean, the, the and also, sorry, it's hard, Joe, because yeah. when you're in when you're in treatment, it's just I'm sharing this for people who, who have been in it or enter, it, it, you go to different things. It, it's a lot of your senses. You you are, like for instance, I found the chemo uh, heightened my sense of, uh, of hearing. So that door slamming would be like five times, six times louder, that type of thing. Smell became massively strengthened. So the toxins and the different tubes and the different things that went to your body. Um, you can almost smell them and they become almost nauseating because they, you, you know you, you know they're going into your body but you can smell and the smell will become really 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 hard those sort of things so and the visual one of the a lot of the toxins that I had in my chemo uh, 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 sessions there were three or four bags you'd get over a two or three hour period but there's one big a needle that was like something you'd use in a horse and that would go in straight into your vein but that was like a red 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 bright red Man United red liquid and even looking at that uh, would t turn your stomach because you you say that's going into my body. So it's it's your senses, it's your it's your vision, it's your hearing, um, it's your smell, um, and funny those you don't expect that, but but they are the big battles uh, when you're in in treatment. Mm. Those type of things that you don't anticipate. I would have thought know. it would just be either vomiting or just I'm, I'm so yeah. tired I can't stand. Yeah, yeah, no, it's your senses. Now it just it brings home how important your senses are, like in terms of. Uh, our smell, our hearing, our, our vision, mm. yeah, and that's where, that's what I found. Uh, they, my senses were attacked most, you know, which is just a, just as a by the way. And are you in a place, uh, thirteen years on, where yeah, you're, been, you're looking over your shoulder at all times? No, or? no, uh, you just get you you live with it. I mean, I have been lucky. You know, I haven't. 
I go, I'm back to St James's on a regular basis for checkups and that, but I have never, uh, uh, you know, technically I'm in remission and and I'm just getting on with life and, enjo- and enjoying working. You know. Yeah. Do, what effect did that have? On but you? I think for those, five, but I do look back in those seven eight years when I look back now, I was a, I, I was beaten up mentally, whereas I'm not now. Okay. But it took me a long time to come through it, and I think people need to know that too. It, you know, you it, it is a battle for a number of years before you. You, you you physically might get back on your feet, but mentally to get back on your feet and say, okay, no, I'm, I'm you know, yeah. I'm ready now to uh, get back, you know, literally full on yeah. on on my on my life. And it's funny you you mentioned like the phrase post traumatic stress when we were talking at the start of the conversation, mm. the shock of cancer, that word alone, and then going through what you went through. Mm. Was there a you know from a mentality point of view, what affected going through all that, haven't you? Um, I th- I know it has it has a tough effect on you, but um. It's more that you are, uh, but, but but everything is is um, is relative to the moment in time in terms of where you are. You know, you do what you got to do. Like as human beings, we're able to take, we're able to. As human beings, we have the ability to face anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Luckily, that's the way we're made. And when you're in a bad place, you know, you face up to that. You know what you got to face up to, and then when you come out of it, you you know you sort of you you put yourself back together again. You know what I mean? And that's what we do. So you know, um, and in in facing. We all face our mortality in yeah, a yeah, yeah. philosophical sense. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. God, look, I spent far too much time thinking, doing the maths and working yeah. out, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you face it in a very real, acute sense. Mm. So did that crystallise what you think the point of life is or how you want to spend your time or regrets about how I've lived and I'm going to live differently going forward? Any of that stuff? No, I think you... No, not, not really. I think you do... You're, you're, there's a practical nature to it. I mean, you know, there was a period in time where... Uh, second time around where you know my fixation was was money in terms of to know okay you know what what pay I would I get from this insurance and what would happen here and what would happen here and I was just you know calculating exactly how much money uh, you know my debt would bring my family I'm worth, so, I'm worth more dead than alive yeah and, 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 and I was quite happy with the numbers and, and I found that <laughs> very satisfying right yeah no I did I found it very satisfying that's, that's a good number okay there was no sense of a Poor me, because you're not. You're just doing, you're just rationalising and doing your numbers. My and family will be okay. Yeah, nothing more important, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so I did the numbers for about a year or two, and I went back and did the numbers again and repeated the numbers. And uh, on one occasion, I was asking, double and treble guessing, uh, checking uh, the numbers to make sure that uh, these are the numbers. Mm. You know? So, uh, just I, it's probably me. I've taken you down these dark no, uh, areas. Uh, it's been amazing conversation. You seem uh, very content. Uh, all that said, said, you know, the things we talked about are heavy, but like you, uh, even chatting beforehand, you seem in a, in a lovely place in your life. I wouldn't say so, no. I think I'm a basket case. Right. Yeah, I have a bad brain and uh, it's hard to control. Um, you know, it is. I'm, I'm always... Um, I'm always, you know, sort of getting ideas in terms of what I want to do next. So, we, you know, we've heard books as an imprint. We've just started a new imprint called Umbrella and we have a third imprint called My Club Media and... So, you know, I have a lot of things I need to do and I want to do, but my brain is one of those brains that I get a lot of ideas and what, you know, this would be a good idea, this would be a good idea. And the one thing I know, um, the one thing I know uh, from being in, in public working with people is that our brains are susceptible to, okay, coming up with some good ideas, but coming up with a whole load of bad ideas. And uh, my brain is no different. Yeah. So my brain, my daily basis is probably, when I say a basket case, is trying to, because my brain will be full of ideas. Mm. I mean it. All sorts of ideas, books, 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 business. It's just chaos. So I will spend far too much time every day trying to work out, okay, what is a good idea? What is this a bad idea? I have people come to me talking to me about books or I, uh, you know, submissions, and it's a terrible idea. It's the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. It's a terrible book. Mm. Two people won't buy it, but the person might be committed to it and may have spent two years working on it and is going to stay working on it. It's a bad idea that has taken seed in the person's brain and they weren't able to just get rid of it. But we're all, we're all vulnerable to good and bad ideas. Like, you know, you have a great idea for an interview. Well, maybe it's not a good idea. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, so, but I am calm. I'm, I'm busy, I'm calm. But yeah, <laughs> my brain is... is uh, my brain is... is uh, busy. Is, oh, it's always a bit of a wreckage, yeah. This therapy session on Tuesday is going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. It's going to be one. I promise my friend it's going to be one and one only and there's never going to be a second <laughs> well, you for might, a long time. Why not? Why not? Because you don't want to be in my brain. Okay. I don't want to be in my brain. Do you think you'll do it eventually? <laughs> you're putting it at your... Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah. I think oh, maybe I would. Maybe I would. I don't know. I don't know. 
it'd be a glib thing for me to say you should but and all our brains are a wreck are a, are a train wreck uh, like so I mean you've got to be careful yeah opening boxes they're all train wrecks yeah you know yeah uh, will you not for the love of God go and watch Colin O'Rourke's meet in person in the championship this year I don't think I w- no I don't think I will I don't think I will they get to a Leinster final Against Dublin, it's Dublin. <laughs> Beat Dublin in Leinster final, maybe. But uh, no, I don't need to. That was part. That was that was then, and I wish them the best. Yeah, uh, I wish them the very best. I mean, I went down and coached my dad's team, Carlo, for two years, or four, or five, or six. So, so I, you know, I, I can immerse. I, I coached my local team in Luke and Sarsfields for two years. Mm. So I can invest myself and and you know, get back into a GA life, and I enjoy watching games. But I enjoy watching all games. Okay, you know what I mean. I've got to say, I enjoy hardly more than football at the moment. Um, whereas when I was a footballer, um, the hurling people would be glad to hear this. When I was a footballer and for vast chunks of my life, I'd only watch the All Ireland hurling final. It'd be the only game I'd watch all year. Whereas now, I think hurling is a, is an amazing sport. Mm. You know, I think it's it's it's, uh, it's just fascinating. There's so many good teams, like just like eight or nine really great teams out there, which we don't have in football. Mm. Uh, it's not quite the same. Um, uh, and th- and those eight or nine hurling teams are all at such a good level. Like they're all at elite level, yeah. whereas the football teams, the top eight or nine football teams, are all like, you know, you got to ask questions of four or five of them. You know, where, you know, where are Donegal? You know, where are Monaghan? Mm. You know, where are Tyrone? You know, they won the All Ireland two years. Where are they now? Yeah. You know, whereas in hurling, you know, there's a lot of teams that are really well coached, well managed, well funded. I think it's really impressive what's happening in hurling. Mm. The real tragedy is that three quarters of the country can't play the game. I mean, that's the not le- I'm not, not knocking the Meads and the Toronto. Not least in Mead, as we No, but I'm just saying, they, they, not, when I say they can't play the game, they're not encouraged to play the game. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They get no backing from their own counties, from their own people, from the likes mm-hmm. of me. They get no proper... If you look at the GA, you know, you've got, say, 20 counties out there who, who aren't competitive in hurling. 20 counties. Yeah. Like, the first thing, the GA and, and Charlotte Burns getting the job is great, um, but the first thing, the biggest thing the GA have to do is to get those 20 counties... Uh, full support to really uh, become um, you know more competitive as, as hurling counties mm. that's it's a it's 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 a crying shame that, that nobody's done that and a final uh, point do you like uh, when the best teams play each other in football do you mm. like what you're seeing on the pitch as a spectacle quality yeah no I love that I mean I love the, I love I love Dublin I love I love watching watching Dublin I love, you know you could watch Kieran Kilkenny all day you could watch James McCarthy all day you know the Brian Fentons. I mean, they're just special players. I mean, I, and when I watch a match, I, I like to you know watch an individual. They're the type type of people. Okay. Um, Clifford's doing it for you, I presume. Yeah, to a degree, but I'm a little bit. You know, I think you know. I think we've all got to calm down a little bit about him. Um, you know, he's he's only now reaching his peak, and they're already trying to say he's the greatest of all time, which is ludicrous. Obviously, um, you can't say anyone's the greatest of all time when they're only 24, 25. He hasn't even he hasn't even re- he hasn't even reached his own peak. You know what I mean? 24, 25, 26, 27. What if his non-peak He's, is already the greatest of all time? I, well, it can't be. It's impossible to be the greatest of all time. In his, you can be the greatest of your generation. Like, you look at... You compare, like, like Brian Fenton is, is you know, the greatest midfielder of his generation. You know, but is he the greatest of all time? Would Jack O'Shea have... Jack O'Shea would have been absolutely made for the modern game. Jack O'Shea would have been, in my view, Brian Fenton plus 50% in the modern game. Jack O'Shea with his engine would have been unbelievable. Plus, he would have been unstoppable. Plus, plus 50 is a lot. Oh, Jack O'Shea was... Jack O'Shea was like an Olympic... Pe- Jack O'Shea was like an Olympic athlete. People don't realise... Like, you look back at the 70s and 80s and it was Stone Age activity, OK? Tactically and, and it, was, it, it was a bit of madness. Yeah. But within that madness, there were amazingly elite athletes... Jack O'Shea, Pat Spillane. I mean, the first time I marked O'Shea, I just I felt in the presence of somebody. I mean, I was, we marked Jacko in Navan in front of 15 towering Mead fans. The first time Kerry came to Navan. And I was just a gossip and had no idea what I was doing there. But you know what I spent? I spent half, I was having an hour running around with him, just looking at him <laughs> and thinking. And you know what I was thinking most? This is my brain. You know what I was thinking most? Because people always said I had a funny brain when I was football. I spent the whole game thinking, isn't this fantastic? <laughs> I'm beside Jack O'Shea and I'm marking him and I'm 
still with him. There's me and Jack O'Shea. And all these people are looking at me and Jack O'Shea. That's all I kept thinking for an hour. Mm-hmm. Because I've been looking at Jack on television for as a kid. And I said, isn't this amazing? Jack O'Shea. And here I am beside him. There's no question of trying to stop him. But that aside, yeah. that madness aside, people now, nowadays, and I'm saying this about you and your generation of writers, and I'm not knocking you, you just can't know. Can't. Jack O'Shea was an Olympic athlete. Mm. He was unbelievable, you know. Um, you know, they talk about Larry Tompkins, you know, going over to England and literally knocking all the professional athletes out of the way, beating them, like, you know, beating Alan Shearer in a bike ride by, by something like 10 minutes, like just destroying them, right? Tompkins was, was just a crazy competitor, but, like, I'm talking about untouchable as an athlete. Jacko was untouchable as an athlete. So when you're comparing the Fentons and the Cliffords to athletes of the 80s or when you're comparing athletes of the 80s to the 60s, you know, I'm sure the same athletes were there in the 50s and 60s in GA field. So, mm. you know, you can't say the greatest of all time. Sure. I mean, what, what, what Clifford is doing is jaw-dropping, right? But, uh, no, he's, he's you know, He's not, uh, you can't put the crown on his head and just knock all the previous generations and say, sorry, boys. Yeah. I'm being screamed at to end this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now you started me. Uh, yeah. it's, it's so interesting. <clears throat> Can we let the football championship play out over, over the next few months? You watch it or don't and then come in at the end of it and give us your thoughts on the season that was and we'll talk about Jack O'Shea some more. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, yeah. be a deal. Um, Thank you, Joe. You went to deep places there, so we appreciate it. And I, I hope you're okay with that. Amazing to have you in. And, and let's have that football chat in more detail in, in a couple of months' time. Lee May's pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you Joe.